We are on the doorstep of the festival of Rosh Hashanah. Of course, this is a very significant day in our calendar. It's the first day of the year. It's the day of judgment. It is the day that marks, of course, the creation of Adam. On this day, humanity began. And on this day, humanity floundered and blundered. And the sin of Adam and Eve in the garden was on this day as well. And on this day, there's judgment. And this day also marks the coronation of God because a king without a nation is not a king. And therefore, although the world was created on the 25th day of Elul, which is you know, six days before Rosh Hashanah, when do we mark the beginning? When is the world actually beginning? It's once we have humanity, once we have Adam, once we have the capacity of free choice, once we have this incredibly uh, conflicted entity, half body, half soul, this mess of an existence, half angel, half animal. And this is the objective of creation. This is why God created the world. This is what it's all about. And this is when we revisit those themes each year. The Talmud tells us that on Rosh Hashanah, every single human in the whole world is judged. Everyone passes before God like sheep. And everyone is given their fate, their destiny for the year. And some are told, are sealed, or are written into the book of life. Some are sealed, in fact, to the book of life as well. Some are written to the book of death. And this is a very serious day. Of course, on Rosh Hashanah, we have a lot of ceremonies and traditions and rituals that we do. Of course, the mitzvah of, of blowing the shofar, we have quite extended prayers, and uh, we celebrate it as a festival. But there's a lot of different things going on here on this on this day. And as we have been doing now for the last year almost. It's become a torch tradition. We get together with uh, the torch rabbis, the wonderful podcasters of torch, the wonderful talented staff here. And we have a round table and we discuss some ideas about the festival. And hopefully, you know, we don't compare notes. So everyone comes in without any idea of what the colleagues are going to talk about. It's possible that someone will say the same thing that I have saying, even though I highly, highly, highly doubt it. But maybe it could happen. But we're surrounded by uh, these incredible uh, sages and scholars. Uh, of course, we have Rabbi Nagel, who's been with Torch since 1998. And then we have Rabbi Wolby, who's been here since 2005. And this is a little bit of a, of a Willis Reed moment, because Rabbi Wolby's really, really not feeling well. But he's weathering the storm to come uh, join us uh, for, for this podcast. With great joy. And With we're very joy. happy to have him here. Uh, we have Rabbi Vasco, who's been a team member since 2019. Is that right? That's right. Shalom. And uh, Dan, who has been part of the staff of sorts. I, I don't podcast know how, extraordinaire. Yeah, certainly. <laughs> but has been part of the board and been a student and then kind of now has graduated into this auxiliary staff. Still uh, student. Still student. Uh, since, student. I guess, I don't know, 2013 or so. Uh, and then there's me, uh, Yakov Wolby, and uh, very excited about this uh, wonderful opportunity to get together and hopefully to prepare and to enrich the upcoming day of Rosh Hashanah that is swiftly approaching in about a week and a half now as of this recording. So uh, I'm excited to get uh, going on that. And we'll, we'll start with Rabbi Wolby because I know he's not feeling well. He wants to just say his message and, uh, and then go get some more, uh, some more uh, lemonade, uh, so some tea, something like that, some TLC, some, uh, some love uh, from, uh, um, of course, from all the listeners. We all wish him uh, best. And, Thank you. Uh, Everything is fine. It's just. And, uh, but this too was also decreed on Rosh Hashanah, that's right? That's right. That's right. Last Rosh Hashanah, it was decreed that Rabbi Wolby is going to have a rough day here with the with the podcast, but uh, he's weathering through. So why don't you get us started? So not such a rough day. Had a fabulous morning with a great two classes, Nitzavim and Vayelech, the Parsha Review podcast, which are cliff notes to Rabbi Yaakov Wolby's Parsha podcast, and. I want to just share two quick ideas about Rosh Hashanah. The first is that if you notice, the mouth of the shofar is very, very small. But at the end of the shofar, it gets very, very big. You know, you blow a little sound, you give a little push, and it gives out a great sound. We sometimes don't appreciate small change. Something very, very small can have enormous effect. 
And I think every day we're blowing the shofar should bring to our recognition how important it is to never think for a moment, oh, it's an insignificant thing. I shouldn't even bother with it. Every little seemingly insignificant movement has unbelievable impact down the road, just like the shofar. The second thing is that many people say, look, I'm already older. I did a lot of things that I regret, but you know, it's like it's too late. In our tefillah, in our davening, in our liturgy, every Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, we say, particularly on Rosh Hashanah, Ze hayom this is the day of the beginning of Hashem's creation. And just a little bit of a Hasidic twist to it, it's my own idea, so it may be totally nonsense. But Ze hayom today is the day, we know it refers to God, as Yaakov said, Rabbi Yaakov said in his introduction, that this is the day that God created Adam and Eve. This is the beginning of God's creation, the purpose of creation. But I think we can change it. Today is the beginning of your new actions. Today is the day of change. You want to make a change in your life? Don't wait to, to another day. Begin that change today. Impact your life by making a change, however big, however small, Make it today. Make it impactful, and that change will hopefully last for an amazing year to come. Thank you so much. Amazing twist. I'm not qualified to say whether or not it's nonsense, but I, I like it. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's fantastic. And certainly those those themes, the, the impact of, of a small deed, a lot of times we tend to discount the little things. The little things don't really matter. Uh, but certainly if you study the Torah, it's very clear from our sages that it's those really small things that, uh, A, they make a big impact, but also they begin a transformation. They change a trajectory. They could realign a person. And, and you know, the first step of any massive journey is very small, but it's the first step. And uh, this is the day of first steps. And even if that's fo- the first step is just a small little shuffle, you just move your foot a little bit in the right direction, you're now a different person and you are judged as such. They say that if you take a plane flying from New York to California and you adjust it only one degree, it'll end up in Mexico. Because that one degree right here is nothing. But in the big picture, it's... A thousand miles away well, or sh- more. They should do it maybe 10 degrees and end up in Texas. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Come join us. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Wolby, for that wonderful, insightful lesson. Uh, we, uh, it, 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 this, this, we could stop now. This is, this is good enough for us. Just start. Don't be scared. Start little. That's okay. And it's an opportunity for total transformation. If, if man, if humanity was created on this day, then we get to forge a new version of ourselves on this day as well. And that is a completely revolutionary insight and one that could not only change our Rosh Hashanah, it could change our life. So very, very powerful. What a way to start. Rabbi Nagel. Anyway, it's great to be here. Um, I just want to say that uh, although we did not uh, also compare notes at all, but um, I would also highly doubt that anybody's going to say what, um, what I'm going to say because I just thought of it. <laughs> okay, so it's new. It's fresh, very fresh, fresh out of the oven. So there's a very fascinating question that, that uh, I don't know if anybody really thinks about. Every month before the month, the Shabbat before the month, we do a, uh, what's called a, a Kiddush HaChodesh, a sort of, we do. We we have a special prayer that the upcoming month be a month of blessing, be good for us. Make this new month a good month, and we do that every single month of the year. We have we announce the molad when the when the first inkling of the new moon is going to start, and we do that every single month of the year, except for one particular month. And if you can't guess, it's, of course, this upcoming month of Tishrei. We just don't do it. So why not? Why is that? Why is that? This is the question that I'm... And and there's also no Rosh Chodesh, right? Well, we we barely mention the fact that it's a new month. But it is a new month. It's the month of Tishrei. Yeah, the the day of Rosh Hashanah is on the first day of the month, first day of Tishrei. And uh, the fact that it's a new 
month seems to be very much discounted. Discounted and ignored. Okay. That's the, well, that's the focus is that why are we not announcing the mullet and what is the message behind that? Okay. Mullet, again, being the beginning, the brand new moon when it first the appears. The beginning, very beginning inkling of the new moon over uh, the city of Yerushalayim. We know we have a calculated when it's going to happen. Okay. So. Just the question? No, no, no. It, no, it no, happened no. the same. That wasn't what I was planning on talking about. So, okay. Okay, good. So I'm good. Okay. So <laughs> no, actually, I'm, I'm actually it's not just the question. <laughs> to me, there's a, an unbelievable insight that's very powerful for all of us and a message for all of us. When we make that announcement of the Molod, it's kind of like the song that uh, Orphan Annie would sing, the sun will come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that the sun will come out tomorrow. She knows that the sun's coming out. Well, I've got news for you. The end of this year, I don't know what's going to happen. In other words, the reason why we cannot announce the Molad is because all the energy that was infused in this year was infused for this year and this year alone. And at the end of the year, it's over. Is there going to be a continuation? Is there going to be a new year? That's decided on Rosh Hashanah. So to go ahead and announce that, oh, by the way, the Molod's going to be, oh, I don't know if the Molod's going to, I don't know what's going to be. The year that is passed is going to finish. That's all we know. Whether there will be a new year is up to God to decide whether it's worthy to begin a new year. That's why we, that's my explanation. I have not heard this anywhere or seen this anywhere. That's my explanation of why we don't, we specifically want to convey this idea that God infuses each year with its energy, with the necessary for the existence of the world. And it ends at the very end of the year. The beginning of the new year is a new decision on God's part to continue the world. And that's how weighty it is and how important it is and how much of an opportunity of brand new behavior is also available. Because just like God is making a brand new decision come the new year, that sh- let's, let's give it another year. Let's give it a year. Let's allow this year to exist. Let's infuse the energy necessary for the existence of the world. We, we too can do that same exact thing. The, the recognition of there's so much newness that's happening is why perhaps an insight, why we do not want to even claim that there will be something. Well, who says? We don't know. And when it happens, then we try to recognize God's amazing kingship over this world. That's my thought. Absolute uh, sheer genius. You know, we just assume that the rules of the world are so fixed in stone. They're rules of physics, and, and they're, they're, they're set into place. And however they got to them, we don't know, but they are ongoing. And you're telling us that, no. Every year, Rosh Hashanah, the Almighty decides, again, okay, let's re- recreate the whole world anew. And let's say install the rules of the constellations and and the you know the patterns and the rhythms of the moon and therefore ahead of time we cannot presuppose so to speak that uh, the moon's gonna be at a given time because that's that's by last year's rule last year's rule and that whole universe of of the world operating as it always does that we don't know it it's going to culminates at the end of the year exactly it so ends. so there's a there's a chance you are saying that city of Houston can be recreated anew as being hospitable to human life. That's what you're saying. <laughs> There's a possibility. Well, I was actually going to ask, what, what, is, what, what are you saying? What's the takeaway other than there's a chance that the entire universe might just blink out of existence? I, yeah, I'll my tell goal you what it means yeah, to me. Please. I'll tell you what it means to me is that with that mindset, think of what that means. To, instead of taking for granted that next year is going to come and go, but thinking like, I, I have one year to contribute towards making sure that it continues. The level of productivity that, in, you know, not thinking that you have ongoing years, it's a great mindset. And I, and I, it's a challenge. Like yeah. you say, it's a challenge of the upcoming year. First of all, that it will exist. And really, what's the determinant of whether the next year is going to exist is how well we've done this year. You know, God can decide, let me cut my losses here. 
So it's, it's a very scary. No, it's a very scary thought. After all, he invests so much into the upkeep of this world, so to speak. So yeah. to speak. But he put it's for from our perspective. There's so much that goes on to make this world continue to exist, and if it could, if if we're not doing anything to, that gives God that, say, hey, let's let's hold, let's not let's not be so rash to to call it quits. Let's give it a chance. That's what we're aiming for every year, and that is like you know again, it's like uh, coming to a board uh, decision of whether to continue any company it would say well we had suffered some losses we've done now this that the other sideways different ways and the board has to make that decision it's like well do we want to continue this and that's god's decision every single year do i want to continue this world is it worthy to continue and it's not looking at god doesn't look at not only how well we do but how well does he project us to do so of course what that shows is really goes back to uh, Rabbi Arye's set, you know, idea, small change. Okay, well, look, there was some changes. There's some positive growth here. Okay, let, let's give it another. Let's give it another year. Let's give the. Let's infuse it in the blessing and the necessary things that this year should exist. But the point being is that that itself is such a. You know, when you realize what the gravity. Mm-hmm. of what's happening on Rosh Hashanah, that itself lends us to appreciate what's at stake. And that's the idea. It's a I bit think thrilling. It's, I think it's a beautiful idea. And I, I, I'll tell you, we say in our prayers every morning, that God renews in His goodness every single day Genesis. And I always understood that as Genesis is not just a once and done. You do it once, God did it once many years ago and then set it into place. Every single day in his goodness, he renews Genesis. And thus the fact that the sun rises in the morning, that is a brand new, it's a brand new sunset. It, 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 a sunrise, it, it, ha- it happened for the first time of this version, so to speak, of Genesis. Not, just, you're saying, not just every day, tamid, okay, always. Okay, the, so yeah, says ongoing, yes, every moment. ongoing, yes. Constantly recreating the world, infusing the world with vitality. But what Rabbi Nagel is saying is that this is on, uh, kind of on a higher level. So that we this- could, that's we made. could we could assume almost uh, to a certain extent we could assume that you know we had Rosh Hashanah and we can assume safely I don't know if we can but we 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 work with the premise that you know the next month is going to come and tomorrow the, tomorrow's another, that we just assume that when it comes to Rosh Hashanah it's it's an, the, the whole world's being judged and there's a higher level of being ju- of judgment and therefore we're not making that assumption the now we'll tell you is being made right I was yeah. thinking you know, the Gemara says that there were um, three women that uh, became fertile and bore children on Rosh Hashanah. Uh, three very famous women, uh, Sarah, Sarah, and, and Rachel, Rachel. I got I to gotta, I gotta burnish my bona fides here. I got to say it in the English and in the yeshivish. I got to throw in a little word of Yiddish here so you guys don't think that, I, you know, you're speaking like uh, I, I told my uh, class, I started teaching at the local girls' high school twice a week. I said, Please forgive me if I lapse into English. Please forgive me. <laughs> what are you, some kind of college boy? <laughs> and of course, Hannah, Hannah, right? What, what does that mean? What it means is, is that they were created. So this, the, the verse is about Sarah, Ain Lavala. She doesn't have the capacity to bear children. And that's true. That was the existence of Sarah in in the way she was created, you know, the previous Rosh Hashanah or the previous Rosh Hashanahs. Comes along Rosh Hashanah and the Almighty says, okay, let's recreate this person once again. Oh, and this time it was determined that Sarah will be recreated anew in, in this upcoming year with the capacity to be fertile and uh, and so on. So that's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful insight because it really ups the ante. It's not like, well, my current life, you know, will move in this, will veer in this direction or in that direction. Everything is on the table. Everything is, is possible. Everything's feasible because it's an entire new you, an entire new you as an individual, as a community, as a, as a country, as, as, as a, a universe, you know, glo- universe <laughs> a, a, in, nationally. Everyone, everything is up uh, uh, for consideration, uh, whether it can be created anew, whether it can be recreated anew in a different fashion, in a different mode, in a different system. And that, of course, uh, raises the stakes. Of, uh, of Rosh Hashanah. Could also answer, that a person might think the books of life and death are open. A person looks back on their year and says, was I really so bad? I mean, would God kill me? 
for the things that I've done, God's just going to kill me. But that's not the case. It, who says that you are just going to continue and God will have to kill you? Everything's on the table. Every, it needs to be determined. Again, does it make sense for you to continue? You're supposing that it, to live and to die means to live and die in the physical sense. Well, it, is it not also true? I don't know. We're here to debate. This is a roundtable. <laughs> I'm just pointing out what your presupposition is. right? Tosos is not like that. I spoke about this uh, hmm. on the other podcast, which I haven't released, so I can't blame you for not knowing that. <laughs> I'm here for comedic relief, don't you know? <laughs> that, that was absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Reverend Nagel, for this uh, really stimulating idea that Rosh Hashanah is not just a day of judgment. It's a day where there's nothing to start off with. You start off with a clean slate. Talk about clean slate. Yes. That's, what we, that's, what that, it's that's so like clean the that ultimate the, clean yeah. slate. Yeah. The, exactly. Our sages to calculate, like we know the, uh, the Gemara hints at, but uh, Rosh Hashanah talk about that when the Sanhedrin was disbanded, they weren't able to do the function of the Sanhedrin, namely to inaugurate the moon, new moon. So how do we have Rosh Chodesh? How do we have any calendar? So people think because well we have a we have calculations we know you know we know it's not the exact length of a lunar moon and you just you know there's a whole system it's a 247 year cycle really in in 13 increments of of 19 years apiece it's all done with mathematical perfection but the halacha is you have to render a new moon as a new moon you have to Declare uh, it. Declare it. Yeah, you you and have sanctify to sanctify exactly. So where's the sanctification? So what the tour says is that. The Sanhedrin calculated up to the year 6,000. Every single new moon, because they, they know with perfect accuracy, and they manually were Makadesh sanctified every new moon going forward to year 6,000, because by the year 6,000 we'll have a reconstituted Sanhedrin uh, by any, any event, in any event. But even then, you to know that but Rosh Hashanah, we don't we don't really know that. Like, or at least we're working with the premise that we don't we don't know that. We we have nothing. We have absolutely nothing. And uh, so yes, they were Makadashit. They they did sanctify it ahead of time. But still, like we're, we're and, and having that posture, like it's the wait. Wait a minute, it's the Shabbos before Rosh Chodesh. We the should first, be. Yeah, what's happening? Oh, what's happening? Yeah, Rosh Hashanah is happening, and that means we have nothing. It's a very very powerful uh, device for us to to get in the mode of what Rosh Hashanah really is. Exquisite. And that you say prepared just now, on the walking way. in, on the, way, on the on drive. The <laughs> you had something else planned that you said, we'll figure it out. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Robert Buster, what did you prepare or discover just extemporaneously? Right. What, what am I going to say is really the, what, what comes out yeah. is, uh, is what's important. A person needs to know. What, what can I actualize for Rosh Hashanah? I mean, all the talk is good, but what are we going to take away with? And how can the average person who doesn't feel very good about themselves and what they've done this year, how can they feel like they're approaching the king and standing in defense of their life? How can they feel like they're doing this with sincerity and with confidence uh, and and we don't we don't really have that much confidence. We're begging for mercy, but when a person feels that dejection, that sense of of unworthiness, it can be hard to muster up that you know do I do I really mean this? Am I really is my heart into this when I feel like I've already given up? And on on the one hand. When we do express these things, these prayers that we say on Rosh Hashanah, which are very lofty, and we're, we're expressing that Hashem is our king and that we're committing to all these things, in one sense we do mean it because our soul is holy and our soul is who we truly are in our essence. And so on that level, it is true, we're not lying, but it's kind of a cop-out because you can always say that. I mean, why did I come into this world? My soul is holy anyway. My soul could have been just as holy, just sitting up there in the heavens and, and coronating the king. So there's clearly a reason that I came into this world. It's not just to say, well, my soul is holy. I have to be holy too with all of myself, with my body, with my, 
with my ruach and my nefesh and connect it all together and express my soul while I'm here in this world. I have to be connected to that. And so on that level, we might feel like we're lacking. So the truth is that we were given a path. Every single Jew is given a path to connect very deeply on Rosh Hashanah, even if we feel unworthy, and even if maybe we truthfully are unworthy. And that has to do with the mitzvah of the shofar. And the mitzvah of the shofar is, is interesting because the Torah commands us to do it, but the Torah gives no explanation for why we're doing it. And not only that, not only the Torah does not explain it, but not in the prophets, at least overtly, and not in the Talmud, Mishnah, or the Gemara. There's no real explanation for exactly what is the reason for this mitzvah, like we have with essentially every other mitzvah that we do on holidays. We eat matzah, the Torah clearly explains why we eat matzah, because that's what our ancestors ate. And we build sukkahs because they dwelt in sukkahs, or they had the clouds of glory, etc. For every one of these mitzvahs that commemorate something about the holiday, there's a very clear explanation for why we're doing it. And the shofar on this holiday, there's nothing. So, so what's it about? There is one hint, at least one, in Tehillim, in Psalms. Psalm 81 there's a series of verses which appear very cryptic if you try to translate it literally. And it goes like this, Tiku b'chodesh shofar, blow the shofar on the month, hagenu, at the appointed time, the time of our festival. Ki chok li Yisrael hu mishpat leliakov, for it is a decree for the Jewish people and a judgment for the God of Jacob. Edus b'yosef samo, it was placed as testimony for Joseph, but say so will Eretz Misraim in his emergence onto the land of Egypt. Sfas lo yodati eshma, a language I didn't know, I will hear. It's kind of incoherent if you put it all together. What's the flow here? What's the narrative? The Radak, the famous commentator on the prophets and the writings, explains as follows Tiku b'chodesh shofar. First of all, blowing the shofar on the month, he says the month is the first of the month, which is the month of Tishrei, the Kesli Yom Chagin, the appointed time, our festival, which is Rosh Hashanah. Gichok li Yisrael hu, because it's a decree for the Jewish people, meaning it's a commandment that we need to do this. It's a mitzvah that, that Moshe told us to do. Mishpat le Yaakov, a judgment of the God of Jacob that came from him. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Edus bi Yosef Samo. It was placed as a testimony for Joseph. The Radak says that here and other places as well, the entire Jewish people is referred to as Joseph. So he says it's a testimony for Joseph, meaning a reference to the entire Jewish people, but say so al Eretz Mitzrayim, when we left Egypt. The Radak says, as it says in the Talmud, that on Rosh Hashanah, when the entire Jewish people during the Exodus narrative. It was on Rosh Hashanah, six and a half months before we actually left the land of Egypt, is when we stopped working. The slave work ended on Rosh Hashanah. So as a commemoration for that, we blow the shofar, because blowing the shofar is an act of announcement that there's freedom. We no longer have to work. Fine. So that, that's the, what the Redak says. But there's another approach. The Gemara says, the Talmud says, Edus bi Yosef Samo. It's jo- the reference to Joseph here is the actual Joseph, Yosef Atzadik, Joseph, the son of Jacob, in his emergence onto the land of Egypt when he got out of prison and came out to the land of Egypt to serve as viceroy. So the Talmud says as follows. When Pharaoh took him out to interpret his dreams, and he saw that he interpreted them very well, and he saw something special in Joseph, he said, I want this man to rule. All of his servants, the rest of the nobility, cried out. They pushed back against him and said, it's not appropriate for someone, a slave, who was sold for 20 little pieces of silver. You're going to put this person and rule over us, and rule over the entire nation? You can't do that. And Pharaoh said, I see something in this person. This is not, this is not a peasant. I see nobility in him. I see monarchy in him. And they said, fine, even if that's so, there's a rule 
that if you want to serve in the monarchy, you have to be able to speak the 70 languages of the world. You have to be able to communicate on that level. Lo and behold, Joseph was miraculously able to speak all 70 languages. How was this done? The Talmud tells us that the angel Gabriel had come to Joseph, had come to Joseph and taught him all 70 languages. Overnight, miraculously, just fed him, channeled him the knowledge of all of these languages. And the question is, why, was, why did he merit this miracle? Two years previously, when Joseph was in that prison, he was sitting there, he wasn't alone, he was sitting there together with two other inmates, the minister of the bakers and the minister of the butlers. These people had been also imprisoned and were terrified for their life, possibly going to be executed. There was a night that they had these dreams. And they woke up the next day, they were distraught, and Joseph noticed that they looked a bit downtrodden. And so he approached them and said, why the long face? And that's an amazing thing right there. The fact that Joseph approached them and noticed that they looked a little bit down. I mean, think about it. Joseph was also in prison. He had been betrayed by his brothers, tossed out of his family, sold into slavery, falsely accused and thrown into prison. You'd think that someone in a position like that would be a little bit wrapped up in their own problems. And yet he notices that someone else doesn't look very good. And who are these people that don't look very good? These are people, part of the establishment, that threw him in the prison in the first place. Not exactly his friends. And furthermore, this was not the first day they were in prison. They woke up from a dream. They probably didn't look too good the day before. They had just been on top of the world, and now they're in prison, about to be executed. And so he notices that they look slightly worse today than they did yesterday. Through that act of extreme boundless compassion, that he noticed the nonverbal communication, he noticed their face looked a little bit different, and he reached out beyond his own problems, and he said, what's the matter? How can I be of service to you? In that merit, Hashem saw this is a person who understands communication. This is a person who understands how to connect to people and is not bound within his own cage. And so in that merit, he was taught all of these languages because at that point, he already had the keys to communication. He just needed the words. Fine, the angel will give him the words. And miraculously, he was able to speak all of these languages. So how is this relevant to us? So to tie this idea together, I'll tell you a story that the Baal Shem Tov, the great Hasidic master, said the following parable to illustrate what Rosh Hashanah is all about. Like every other Hasidic tale, it begins with a young prince. The prince was just moving from boyhood into adolescence, and the king noticed that you know this boy has nothing of his own, and he needs to accomplish something for himself. It's not good for him to just receive everything within the palace. He's got to get out and make a name for himself and become a man. So he exiles him from the palace and sends him away, and he gives him some provisions. But before long, before he knows it, the kid runs out of food, his clothes wear out, and now, not knowing what to do, he's found desperate and hungry in a foreign land, and he encounters a band of foreign thieves and robbers. And they take him in, and they give him some food, and he starts to learn their ways. He learns their language. He learns how to rob. He learns how to steal, and he becomes one of them. And over the years of him practicing this, he forgets who he is. And he forgets his past and his home, and he forgets his original language of his homeland. And he takes on this whole new identity. After years of this, there's a commotion in the town. And he asks some of the people what's happening, and they said, don't you know, this is the anniversary of the coronation of the king. The king, this foreign king, is passing through our land, so we're going to come out and celebrate him. And when they start to explain it, he, he starts to remember. Something clicks. He says, that's, that's my father. He remembers who he is. And so he runs toward the caravan to go and find his father and, and to try to ask for his life back and bring him back into the palace. And as he runs, of course, the guards stop him because who's this strange person, this thief-looking individual running toward the king? They're about to cut his throat. And he's trying to explain to them, beg that, this, no, this is my father. You don't understand. I'm nobility. I'm part of them. But they don't understand what he's saying because he forgot his old language. And they only speak the language of the king. And so 
he's after desperate attempts of trying to beg and plea, falling upon deaf ears, he has no other choice. He falls to his knees and he cries out with a loud wail. And it's so loud that it reaches the ears of the king. And the king, his father, hears this, this voice, this wail, and he says, I, I would know that cry anywhere. That's my son. He pushes past the guards and he brings his son back home. The essence of the mitzvah of the shofar is nonverbal communication. It's when we get to a point where we realize that we have nothing left to say. And we can only cry because there are no words. We have nothing to defend ourselves with. We've lost our way. We've, we've lost our path. And we've lost our ability to speak and express ourselves like nobility. And so the only thing we can do is cry out like a child and hope that our Father will hear us. And in what merit will Hashem listen to our cry? Because as the entire nation of the Jewish people is called Joseph, as the Radak says, it's in the merit of Joseph, the righteous one, who he reached out and he understood nonverbal communication through his compassion. He saw the pain of another person, even though he was wrapped up in his own. And through that merit, he was able to communicate beyond words. Hashem says in that merit, I'll listen to you as well. And I'll add in, I'll suggest maybe, that this verse is very interesting because it says, Fas lo yodati eshma, a language I didn't know I will hear. But that's not really the way you would say it in Hebrew. The real way to say it would be safa, asher lo yodati eshma, a language. It says sfas with a tuf at the end, which is a construct state. It implies the language of something. And so maybe it's as if Hashem is saying, sfas lo yadati, the language of I don't know. The language of I can't even speak a language. The language of I have nothing to say, but I desperately want a connection with you, and I have no words to put that into, but please hear my cry, eshma, I will hear that. And in the merit of Joseph, in the merit of each one of us reaching out beyond our own bubble of struggles and pain to pay attention to the needs of others, maybe in that merit Hashem will listen to our cry of the shofar and Rosh Hashanah. Bravo. That was, uh, it's twizzy. You said uh, this is for the average person, and we got some direction for the average person from the average rabbi, but I, I would not call this average. It's definitely above average, wonderful we're princes, we're nobility, and we just forgot about it. You know, we kind of li lived a life that was not congruent with who we really are. And uh, like Joseph, you have something within you that, you know, the Pharaoh, the king could spot, and like that prince in that uh, wonderful story. And um, But somehow you, you need the tools to communicate it, and we don't have those tools. We lost those as well. And the shofar, are, that's, that's the tool. The, the shofar is the tool to be able to have that language, that conversation, that nonverbal conversation with our father, with the king. I do want to point out that with the exception of that last edition, most of this I heard from one of my teachers, Rabbi Yechezko Weinfeld, Shlita, should live and be well. I just want to say things in the name of, of the right person. So, But let me, let me ask you just a follow-up question. Joseph, you established for us, he... Well, he has righteousness. He, he has this compassion, this empathy for his cellmates. And in that merit, the, the angel Gabriel comes and teaches him all those languages. Uh, the, the prince, his father knows his, the sound of his voice. But what about us, you know, the average person? Are you saying that only if we do something special when it comes to our interpersonal relationships, only then does the chauffeur have its efficacy? Or is there some other way that we can mobilize and, and deploy the power of the shofar to be able to transcend our lack of words and our lack of credibility and standing to come before God? Is there any other way that we can do that? Well, I meant there's two things. Number one is like the Redak says, the entire Jewish people is called Joseph. We have this trait within all of us. It's embedded. It's part of our nature. But are you, are you saying we, that we need to do, to do something special or we already are like Joseph? We, 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 have, we, have, we have that downloaded uh, language, so to speak, the 70 languages, the, 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 the shofar. We uh, have that capacity. We have that ability and we, we need to express <clears throat> it. I, I would suggest that the more we express that, the more Hashem will respond in kind. 
but it's possible you have this ability. Well, and what the does. Talmud does say that if you're merciful upon others, God will be merciful upon you. If you forgive others, God will forgive you. So the, the, the Talmud does say this. Um, but I, I was thinking what you would say is, and this kind of gets into what I wanted to talk about, it's adjacent. I think maybe it would it fit nicely with what you're saying, um, is that maybe we don't have any merit, but we come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they do, and they bestow that merit upon us. And yes, you know, maybe personally, all of us, who are we to come talk before a king? You look at our year, and it's very hard for most people to say that, to say with confidence that they feel comfortable to be completely scrutinized before God. Most people don't have that ability to do that. Uh, certainly if they have a sensitivity to, to, to understand the degree of judgment that's possible uh, by uh, the divine tribunal. Well, it has to be but connected. But we have, we have Abraham, Isaac, Jim. I know my grandfather, Buzzman, used to say that if you have this feeling on Yom Kippur, they're like, who am I? I'm not worthy. Or Rosh would be the same as well. You just remember, I have, I have nothing. But who do I have? I have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in my corner. The forefathers are in our corner and their merit doesn't get diluted over the course of the generation and it, it exists within us. It courses within us. And that's that's our claim to come before God. We start off our prayer, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why are we saying that? Because who am I to come talk before God? I am the descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Actually, and that is does my... say that their merit has expired already. But even if even if it yeah, would... See that? Embarrass me in front of everyone here. <laughs> well, you quoted Latosis to me earlier. But... Uh... No, we're all learning. <laughs> Where's citation needed? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we know. But but the point is that even if that's the case, it's just nepotism. I mean, how is that fair? No, it's we, only we, because. No, we do. Yeah, well, yeah, it is. It is. It, it's well, it's, not fair. It's but, because but it's, it's, it's built it's into our DNA. It's because that is who you also are. Also true. All, also true. Also true. But we do say we we, we do say many times that uh, in the merit of Isaac and Jacob, you know, in the Torah, of course, it appears many times that. It's not the merit of the Jews that they're renting the land. It's the merit of their of their illustrious antecedents. But in the prayer, we say that a lot of times, right? So it's, 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 it's one of the recurring themes is that we're coming not as individuals, but as extensions, if you will, of of uh, what that really of, of means is that 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 we're we're presenting our potential as you know. Don't forget, it's kind of like a, let's say let's say a baseball player or a basketball player. And you know he comes from really good stock. His Better dad good. was a, was a, was a, a unbelievable. He has the genetics to excel. He just needs to actualize it. That's kind of what we're saying when we say Avram Yitzchak and Yaakov. It's in us. It the, like you say, it's coursing through our own blood. Those qua- those amazing amazing qualities. That means we are saying, don't forget we have that potential, and we can't forget that. We have that potential. So when we say, when will my actions come to God's action, God, our fa- my father's actions? That means it can. there's a connection there. That means it's, there's a way, there's a path in that direction. So what we're telling God is, is that please don't give up on me because the potential of the greats of Avram Yitzchak, of course, through my blood, and I too can achieve something. Those qualities that they exhibited are embedded in our actual DNA, our spiritual DNA. We can have the chesed of Avraham. We can have the gvur of Yitzchak. We can have the teferis, the beauty of Yaakov. These things are in our blood, our They're ability. Within, within striking distance. And therefore, and therefore, well, it's both. We want God to remember that we remember. So we know, like, you know, you can do better. I can do better because that's where I come from. Mm-hmm. And if I remember that, then hopefully, and God will say, "Okay, let's 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 see him." Well, I think there's probably merit, to, mer- merit to both of them. Uh, we have those qualities within us, like the Gemara says that we have the qualities of Baishanim, Rachmanim, Grona, Kasadim, which come from Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, uh, he's called Avram Avinu because. He's Abraham, our forefather, because those qualities became part of the spiritual DNA, like spiritual epigenetics that were conveyed to, uh, to us. But also, even if we are very distant from that, it's still our pedigree. It's still our ancestors, and we can still summon their merit. And that's what we're really doing. Okay? A lot of the of the prayers in Rosh Hashanah are summoning their merit. 
and um, and I think that would fit in nicely with what you're saying. Maybe we're not as righteous as 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 Joseph, and yes, we do have a certain association with him, and there there's an element of Joseph uh, in in all of us. But we also have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those claims, like, do you know who I am? They're still valid. And don't tell me Tostos, okay? Come on. You know, there, there, <laughs> well, there, is, a, there, is, a over here. <laughs> there is a prerequisite. Even in the story of the Baal Shem Tov, he still had to remember that he originally came from there and want to come back. So let's start there. For sure, for sure. Uh, Dan, why don't you uh, share something with us? All right. I'll begin by saying that, as always, it's very humbling to be here. A lot of gratitude. I sort of mess up your introduction when you begin to say, and we're all these great rabbis and sages, and you stop yourself from saying, and Dan. And I appreciate that. But it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here and just listening and learning. And I forget that I actually have to get up and speak because I just enjoy listening to the, the back and forth with all these great rabbis. As my listeners know, I have recently, you know, going through this, this change in how I'm finding my, my livelihood. And it sort of ties into this time of year because I decided to be bold. You know, like when Hashem says, like, I'm sending you out into battle, just, just go with courage because I'm sending you on this mission. So I knew that he orchestrated things for me to sort of figure out a new way in which to make a living. I was like, I'm going to be bold. So I decided to put together four demands before I go out and as I've been interviewing and talking to people. And here are my demands I'm placing on my employment. For one, I'm telling them that I want job security. I want to know that you give up all legal authority to fire me at any point in the future. That's what I want. However, if I decide I want to leave, I can leave. But however, if I decide I want to come back, you got to employ me again. That's what I want, number one. Two, I want to scrap this whole base comp structure and bonus. I want to do something a little different because, see, my expenses, they change. They fluctuate. Things come up all the time. You know, and even just think about Sadaka. You know, you have – you. You send out your sadaka, but being in a community, you get this wonderful opportunity where people just show up at your door. You don't know they're coming. Sometimes it's one after another. You know, so what I'm telling them is that because my expenses fluctuate, what I want to do is at the end of every month, I just want to tell you what my expenses are, and you just pay me that amount. That's what I want to do. Next demand is that you have all these KPIs you want to measure my performance on, on how I grow the business and build it. I want to get rid of all that. I want one KPI, and that is that I try my hardest every day. Okay, maybe I don't get the right outcome you want, but don't measure me on that. Just just whether or not I give it my all every day. It's the only thing I want you to measure me for. And for the uneducated amongst us, KPI stands for? Known performance indicator. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> okay. like a performance metric, right? Okay. So um, the final thing that I'm demanding is that I fully expect an employee review every year. And I made it easy for you because there's only one performance metric I want you to evaluate, and that's whether I just give it my best every day. But if I fail to do that, and you bring that up, and you share that with me, and I want you to, once I express my remorse for that, I want you to accept that. And I want that tarnish on my employee record about the days in which I did not give it my all. I want it to be redacted. Get rid of it. I don't want you to bring it up again. Matter of fact, I want you just to erase it from your memory. Now, those are my demands for my employment. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it's not going over really well in the corporate world. People think I'm a little crazy. But I'm happy to say that someone did accept it, and that is my creator, as you can imagine. And Hashem actually offers that to every Jew. The one that supplies 
all the financial abundance and material needs and spiritual needs through all those earthly employers, the one who supplies everything, those are the terms of our arrangement with him. If the Hashem thing doesn't work out, you could try a university professor. That <laughs> oh, <laughs> shots fired. Oh. Yeah. Except you, you have to be well educated. <laughs> Darn <Wow>. it. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is, is why don't Jews, so many Jews out there, you know, and they insist on carrying the yoke of the war of the world instead of throwing it off instead of replacing it with yoga Torah, which instead of carrying it carries them. And it, and it really just comes down to what the mission of torch is really is that there's so many Jews out there that don't, that do not know this reality. You know, one of the things that, Rabbi Yokoff will be shared. You can correct me if I didn't hear this right. It's, it's been a while. It's been back when I was hearing you lecture out at the synagogue in, in, in Humble. But the way Hashem orchestrated or structured his organization, some people might have a bad taste in their mouth around this, but it's a multi-level marketing organization, correct? Like when Rabbi Ari, after 120 years, goes to Shemayim, and he's looking at his balance sheet, and even though he's on this high level, he's no one's an angel. He'll have his Averos, his sins, which I will say those will be my mitzvos. And when they get to his mitzvos, he'll be like, "This, the accounting's off here, guys. This is way overblown. It's way overblown." I want to, you know, who's doing your books here? Is it the people that did Enron and WorldCom? Like this is way too overbloated here. And they'll say, no, that, that's accurate. That's accurate. Because you see, Rabbi Ari, is that all the Torah you taught, those people taught it to someone else. And you gave your brother and Rabbi Busco the opportunity to work with Torch and teach Torah. So all the Torah they taught, that accrues back to you. And you guys taught Torah to Dan, and he shared it on his podcast. And he loved you guys so much, he moved across town so he could stalk you and live down the street from you. And that introduced him to Rabbi Nagel, and he's learned Torah from him. So all the Torah that Rabbi Nagel taught accrues back to you. So the Well, Rabbi Nagel founded Torch also. That's true. So he's on the top. Well, he's like the number oh, yeah, one of right. the... He's <laughs> all the way at the top of the he's pyramid. He's on the top of the multi-level <laughs> marketing system. You're right. You're right. My point is that when we, when we share Torah with others, it comes back to us, right? It's... It accrues back to us. We never know what that accounting is going to look like. But I want to ask all the listeners to do something, but I actually want you to take that incentive package and put it to the side and forget about it. What I want to ask you to do, I want you to do just out of your love for Hashem and the, the Jewish people. I want you to think back to when you first started listening to Rabbi Wolby, Rabbi Yokoff Wolby, Rabbi Ari Wolby, Rabbi Busk, and sort of learning from them and what that was like that first time you started learning Torah. And remember how just familiar it sounded to you. You know, in last week's Parsha, Moshe says that the Torah is not in the heavens, it's not across the sea, it's in our heart. Because as those of you, I'm sure, who've read Rabbi Yokoff Wolby's book know, when we're in utero, we learn all the Torah. And that is why when we hear Torah for the first time, it's not that we're learning Torah, we're remembering Torah. So here's what I, I want to ask all of you to do. I want you to take out a piece of paper and pen and write the name of 10 Jews who have not been exposed to Torah like you. And if you're driving your car or why you take the time to write those names, just hit the pause button and write those names down and then come back and hit play. Now that you continue to listen, I'm assuming... We don't endorse uh, texting while driving. Exactly. So maybe right after you finish driving. That's what I'm saying. I told them to hit the pause button and then come back home. <laughs> okay, okay. And then write the names down on a piece of paper. And then uh, now they're listening. It's all good. Okay. Safety first, Rabbi. Yeah. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do, my friends. 
every Jew deserves Torah. Look at those names, those, those, those beautiful people that you know that are in your life and they need Torah. And I want you to also consider something else too, is that you know, there was a prophecy in the Zohar on the Parsha of Noah, where it says that there will be another flood with waters from above and waters from below that would flood the world once again. And that that would occur in the year that equated with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And the waters from below are the wisdom from below. Everything that started and transpired and grows at an accelerated pace as we're experiencing today, leading to that device that you're holding in your hand, possibly listening to this podcast. And the waters from above, the wisdom from above, are the, the Torah. And so in actuality, the entire reason you're holding that phone or looking or watching this or listening to this on a computer or watching it on YouTube is for this very reason to use it to share the waters, the wisdom from above. So what I'm asking all of you to do is to f- share one podcast that one of these rabbis have done with each of those 10 friends. Find the one that you know that will speak to them. Share it with them and say, hey, I listened to this. It had a meaningful impact on me. I want you to listen to this as well. And when you're done listening, let's talk about it. I would love to discuss this with you. Just 10 people, my friends. It's Think about what it would look like this time next year when, God willing, we're doing the, the, the roundtable again. And now it's your 10 friends who've been learning Torah for the last year, right? And now they're listening. And I want you to consider something else as well, is that what I've also learned is that at Rosh Hashanah, what Hashem is doing is using a sort of present value calculation and determining our value to His creation. And what present value is, if you're not familiar with it, is when you look at a company and look at the trajectory of the growth of its cash flows, and then you discount back all those future cash flows and bring them back to the present value of what they're worth today. And I want you to think if you share that with 10 people and then this time next year, get them and you to share it with 10 more people, what that will do to your present value calculation at Rosh Hashanah. So that's all I wanted to share, my friends, is a way to take what you've gotten from these rabbis and the Torah you've learned from them, pass it on, It'll have amazing benefits on you and the entire Jewish people. Thank you so much, Dan. I love the idea of comparing our podcasts to Herbalife. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what else? Um, the um, electricity providers and uh, what Amway. other famous? You want, what is it? Amway. Amway, Amway, yeah, Amway. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's so easy. Did I learn that right from you? You said like that. Yeah, I understand well, I think uh, multi-level marketing has somewhat of a bad rap. I know, but unfairly, the structure though it's similar. Yes, maybe yes. we should call it something else. I remember there was a guy in yeshiva trying to get us to buy these wonderful supplements. I get my supplements for free, and you could sell it. Then look how much money you can make. So they all stole it from. Yeah, well, the top point zero zero one percent. There's a big difference. The top zero point zero zero one percent make a lot of money, and everyone else loses money. Here, everyone wins. The only question is, how many gradients of winning do you want? You know, every single word of Torah, the, the value for a single word of Torah, there's nothing in this world that can match the, the value in heaven for one word, one letter of Torah. Nothing. So everyone is it's all winners uh, as far as the eye could see. Even without the reward calculation, I think this is... This is a fantastic idea because it's it's so much better to talk with your friends about something meaningful than to talk about your friends right? or, or right. what you saw on TV. Or it, it's just, it adds Politics. so much depth to the relationships that you have with people when you can discuss Who things that have substance. The island? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great conversation topic. Share it with your friends and then talk about it. Have a discussion about life, about what's meaningful. It's amazing. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So... Um, in our studio, Rabbi Wolby left like an hour ago. Rabbi Nagel's not here. And I feel like that's emblematic of what's happening on the podcast because I'm looking at the recorder. It's about an hour in. 
very few people are listening for me. I always go last, and maybe I should, I don't know, maybe I should go earlier so someone should listen to me. But then again, when I go last, and basically I know that no one's listening, that's okay because I can say whatever I want with uh, very little consequence. Uh, so I'll, I'll do that. But I think, um, all jokes aside, very powerful idea. The Gemara tells us, the Talmud tells us, why do we blow a shofar of a ram on Rosh Hashanah? Specifically, there's a lot of different animals that have horns. So why a ram? Specifically, why is it uh, the best to blow a shofar with a ram? So the Talmud says that if you blow the with the horn of a ram, God, so to speak, will remember the binding of Isaac, son of Abraham, and I will consider it, says the Talmud, as if you yourselves overcame such a challenge and kind of give, give you gave your life for God. So when we blow the shofar, this is what the Talmud says, you blow the shofar and you use a ram's horn, that experience is going to remind God, so to speak, of the binding of Isaac, son of Abraham. And by us doing that, it's like we ourselves kind of went through the experience of the binding of Isaac. And we know that story where Abraham wanted to give up his son and Isaac was willing and uh, the angel stopped it at the last moment and they found the ram thrashing about in the thicket and that was uh, supplanted, um, that supplanted uh, Isaac and Isaac survived. But I want to I kind of understand this uh, a little bit deeper, but I want to frame it with uh, a question. The Midrash says that uh, this ram, it really went to good use. And it kind of goes through every part of this animal, what, what happened with that part of the animal. And it talks about the horns of that, that animal. Not you know, When you use a chauffeur of a ram, it's not the same ram. It's the same species. It's not the same ram. What happened with the actual ram that Abraham sacrificed instead of Isaac? So it says that the left horn... That was the shofar that was blown at Sinai. The Torah tells us that there was a, there was a shofar blast at Sinai. And we, we, what, what was the source of that? It was the ram. And in the future, there's another shofar blast that we are awaiting and anticipating. That's the shofar of Messiah. And that comes not from the left side of said ram, but from the right side of that ram. That is what the Midras tells us. Pirkei Drabalezer, chapter 31. And here's the question. We know that Isaac was slated to be an Ola offering, carbon Ola, an elevation offering. And while well, Isaac wasn't sacrificed, and instead we had the ram, and the ram was in Isaac's stead. But somehow the horns weren't burned. And the verse says in Leviticus chapter 1 that the Kohen, when you, when you process an Ola offering, Vehiktir hakoin es hakol. The the coin has to burn everything, including uh, the Talmud tells us the horns. So how come the horns are still around? Why did Abraham do an Ola offering not compliant with halacha? That is the question of the Arachaim. Arachaim, chapter one of Leviticus of Vayikra, asked this question. Wait a minute, we have a principle where we're told rules of sacrifices. And the Midrash says that the, the horns somehow endured. Why why they endured? The halacha is that the horns have to be burned with the rest of the animal. That's the question. A funny, interesting, intriguing question that uh, most people don't think of because they don't know the laws of sacrifices. They don't know what happened with those horns. But he put those two citations together. There's an obvious problem. And he himself, the Orachaim, the great commentator on the Torah, he offers three different answers. None of them will, uh, you'll find uh, really inspiring. <laughs> First, he says, well, maybe it fell off the altar. And the law states if it falls off the altar, then you don't have to pick it up and put it back in the altar. Or maybe the horns got detached from the animal before it was sacrificed and, and the, the blood service was done. And the law states that in that event, if, if the horns fall off, then there's no need to, only if the horns are still attached with the blood, uh, ceremony is done, only then must the, the horns uh, be burnt. And finally, he says, well, this was before Sinai. Abraham, of course, kept the whole Torah, but there was room for some sort of you know, differences in the actual application, and therefore he did it all a sacrifice, but it wasn't compliant with the rules. Those rules came after Sinai. None of these are very inspiring answers. 
Um, well, maybe they are. I don't know. But it doesn't really seem to change our understanding of what happened here. But what we know for sure is that Abraham brought an Ola offering. Originally, it was supposed to be Isaac. Ultimately, it was the ram. And those horns were not burned. And that should raise our curiosity. Why? Why weren't they burned? Why is it important? However it happened, why is it important that these horns endure? And maybe there are many answers to this question, but it's an incredible comment by the Svasemis. Um, unbelievable. He says that when someone does a mitzvah, you do a mitzvah. What does it mean to do a mitzvah? It means to listen to God. Unbelievable. Every mitzvah is comprised of two parts. There's the, the desire to listen to God, the motivation, the devotion behind the mitzvah, the actual act. And then there is the act. And those two, of course, come together, and you do the mitzvah. The Talmud even says, well, if you, if you can't do the act, for whatever reason, you may still get reward for the desire to do the act. It didn't work out. It didn't work out, but you still have a part of the mitzvah, and you get reward for that. But we know that there are, there are different elements that come together in the performance of a mitzvah. And he says that Abraham had such desire to listen to Hashem, to listen to God. He was willing to give up everything, to give up his legacy. Of course, Abraham, he emerged in the world of paganism, of idolatry, and of child sacrifice. That was not a foreign element to the world that Abraham emerged in. And he, his whole life was battling against that. And finally, he has a son, Isaac, after 100 years. And now Isaac is 37 years old, and this is supposed to be his destiny. And what does Abraham do? He's willing to give up everything to listen to God. It's an unbelievable act of, of sacrifice and martyrdom on Abraham's part, on Isaac's part as well. But that aroused this, this spirit of commitment to God in a level that we cannot even fathom. <laughs> what this actually means, what it takes from Abraham to say, I want to do it. And he wanted to do it. And God stopped him. And you see there's a little interplay where uh, the angel tells him, don't do it. And he says, don't even make a little nick. And Rashi there tells us, well, Abraham had such a desire to do it, to fulfill it. And the angel says, no. So Abraham's like, let me consummate this desire in some way, in some capacity. Let me at least give him a little, small little slit. Okay, the scar, it'll heal. It's okay, right? And the angel says, no, don't even touch him. But Abraham had such overwhelming desire that it was consummated, it was fulfilled with the ram. So there was a complete mitzvah with desire and actualization and implementation. But there was one part of the mitzvah that never got consummated, that remained as unactualized, raw desire to listen to God. And that, when you have that level, it's a much higher level, of course, Hasidic thought going into this. But the desire to do a mitzvah is much more important than the actualization of the mitzvah. The things that are the more ethereal, the more, the more conceptual, the more closer to the intelligence, to the soul, that, that's much more powerful. You do a mitzvah, you have a high devotion. It, 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 it can matter a hundred times more than a regular mitzvah without devotion. The action could be the same, but the actual part of you, the, the human of the human, is, is your ideals, is, is your thoughts, is your desires, is your soul. And therefore, God wanted that there should be some remnant of that original high level, so to speak, desire that was not fulfilled, that was never actualized. And Abraham's will was so great, his desire was so great, we will be ashamed to kind of limit it, to couch it in the action of the ram. We have a shofar. And we blow the shofar. And the Talmud says, you blow the shofar, it's somehow evoking the binding of Isaac. It says that. Says, I will remember, God, because this is a ram and that was a ram 3,500 years ago. How are we evoking, how are we summoning that great event? This is the answer. That there was, there's an element of Abraham's righteousness displayed in this deed that's still alive. That was never concretized, indeed. And therefore, that comes with us. That's, that's permeating the whole world. And you blow the chauffeur, 
you may be spacing out. You may be thinking about how it's taken so long. You may be wondering, you know, what's going to be with the weather or with the sports. Or what. But there's an element in this mitzvah that is still the desire of Abraham that's still present in the world that was never diminished. And that's there. And that's present. And that's with you when you blow the shofar. An unbelievable thing. The shofar was not sacrificed. There was no way to actualize. The, or the, the reality was, for whatever, however it happened, there was, there was no actualization of Abraham's desire when it comes to the shofar, and that is still around. And the Talmud tells us, again, it's the words of the Talmud, the book of Rosh Hashanah, on page 16, I think it's 16a. Let me double check. Yes, 16a. It says, why do we use this, the, the ram? It's not just, oh, this is the ram, that was the ram. There's some part of Abraham and the and the binding of Isaac and and what it, whatever it took from Abraham to do that that will that that to, 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 to summon that courage that 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 fortitude that strength that faith what, there's some element of that that never went away and it's there and when we blow the trumpet we have a ram part of that is being evoked in our shofar. And that's what the Talmud's saying. Hey, listen, I'm remembering something. There's something here that's never that hasn't been forgotten. Has it hasn't? It's not over and done with. It's still ongoing. And we have the capacity, says the Talmud, when we blow the shofar, to kind of hitch a ride with Abraham. <laughs> We're piggybacking on, on him, and our action, so to speak, is a little actualization of, of what Abraham did. And therefore, the Talmud could say it's like you yourself were offered as a sacrifice. We're part of this whole this whole experience. And that's why it is incredibly powerful. So I think it's a, it's a beautiful insight. And of it, course, it does connect with what you said earlier. It is beautiful. You know what's amazing is that in this year in particular, in some years, but particularly this year, Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos. The first you know, day of Rosh Hashanah. The first day of Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos. And that's the biblical mitzvah. Right? The biblical mitzvah is the first day of every Yom Tov. And Correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think that there's any other biblical mitzvah, particularly that has to do with a holiday, some time-bound mitzvah, that if it falls out on Shabbos, we don't do it. Well, the lulav, that's the lulav as well. Oh, right. They won. But it, was, did, it, was, you, it was an old, okay, so we're even now? <laughs> you, did, you did correct me, right. I, I, Are we I even? That. Okay, so, yeah, but so both it's them, not both, both of them were annulled by the same uh, Rabbi Yochanan Metzakai in the aftermath of the destruction of the temple. Right, so... You did remind me of that. So it's not unique to the shofar. But you have this also, it's kind of meta. Right? We're taking this to the next level. Is that on Rosh Hashanah, we'll be standing there desperately wanting to do this mitzvah of blowing the shofar. And we can't. And we're standing there with this, with this raw desire to do this mitzvah of connecting to Hashem to reminisce the idea of wanting to do the will of Hashem and, and being unable to do so. And we're, we're reenacting that as well. I, I would say, this is already, I'm, I'm, I'm speculating, maybe the idea of, of Shabbos is almost the equivalent of our actualization. Like we're, we're keeping Shabbos and we're acknowledging Shabbos, and that in itself is some form of, of a show for, of, of a coronation of God, if you will, um, which is one of the uh, themes of Shofar. But yeah, it, it is a right. fascinating uh, uh, observation. So that, that's an, just an idea. Again, we, we'll have the Shofar opportunity on, on Sunday as well. And I have to remember, with, with respect to the Shofar, the shofar was not sacrificed. I don't know how it was. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Maybe it fell off. Maybe it was severed beforehand or whatever. Regarding the shofar, Abraham's desire to do this incredible mitzvah, it's still in its full, undiminished, untainted, unactualized, raw state. And that is something that we connect to, we channel in our mitzvah. And that is, again, another reason, another tool in our arsenal. This is the mitzvah. It's the mitzvah of the day. It's, it, it, this is the mitzvah of the festival. It's the mitzvah of the shofar. And it's very powerful. And uh, my hope is, is that we all have a, a wonderful, uplifting, meaningful Rosh Hashanah. And uh, we succeed in our prayers. And we make it a productive one, even if it's just very small. Our input's very small, like uh, Rabbi Walby said. Even if it's very little, it's very powerful. It goes a long way. Like the shofar, kind of look at the shofar. And that's the, that's the model. And uh, Rabbi Nagel told us about just, I'm just speaking for them because they're not here, right? <laughs> uh, to realize what's happening. Right? We're, we're having the whole world uh, starting uh, from scratch. The cry of the shofar is that cry when we have no words to say. And of course, uh, Dan 
uh, told us about the importance of, of sharing what we know and, and just what a great deal the Almighty gives us. Uh, our agreement with him is just so lopsided. And uh, to remember this final idea about the shofar, in its raw state, it was never sacrificed. It was never actualized. And it still exists in its high-level form. And we're still writing Abraham's coattails. Everyone should have a ksiva v'chazim May we be inscribed in the Book of Life and all good blessings. May we all be sealed in the Book of Life and all good blessings. May this be a great year, not just for us, for Torch, for the community here in Houston, but uh, for our Jewish brethren around the world, of course, the brethren in Israel as well, and everyone, and the whole world should be a good year. A Amen. Year. Amen. And uh, thank you all. And uh, if anyone wants to email me, my email address is rabbiwalbejuma.com. And Dan, what's your email address? President at Torchweb. He still has org. that, even though he resigned the post. Oh, 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 okay. <laughs> Rabbi Basto? You can contact me at the average rabbi at torchweb.org. And uh, for uh, our friends who are no longer in the Torch Center with us, awalby at torchweb.org. Rabbi Nadal, I think, at Gmail and at Yahoo work. Um, but uh, take care. And please, I will speak together uh, before Yom Kippur, hopefully. But that would have a wonderful if, Rosh Hashanah. If there's a world, by the way. <laughs> In the event that there is uh, a world uh, for Yom Kippur, we'll get together, please, God. Uh, and uh, Shana Tova, everyone.